Would you help me welcome Mr. Wilson? Thank you, Doris. Uh, let me make a comment if I could about John Walsh. Is John still here? John. John Walsh was president of Friendswood Development Corporation, one of the largest development companies in the world. Uh, I built several million square feet of this and that. Uh, he built like 200 million square feet of office, uh, 150 million square feet of uh, shopping centers and so forth. And I was able to persuade John Walsh for a dollar a year to become our full-time director of the real estate program in, Houston, in the University of Houston. A very talented guy. He's raised almost $800,000 for the program single-handedly. Uh, but anyway, he's really not going to be dead. One more comment about the real estate program. I called a meeting about uh, three or four or five years ago, I think it was, when I was trying to determine if we needed a real estate program in Houston, which I thought we did. So I had Lewis Scar of Hines there and, uh, and uh, Ed Wolf uh, and uh, Gennard Gross and all of the leaders in each flavor of real estate, there's about 12, there. And <clears throat> we made a presentation, the dean of the College of Business and I, we made a presentation about an undergraduate program. And sitting at that table, Stuart, they told me, we don't need an undergraduate program. Our people already have a bachelor's degree. We need a graduate program taught at night so that the executives at Heinz, for example, that, uh, that have their bachelor's degree can raise it to the next level. So that's why we have the program that we have, and as John pointed out, it is practice-based. Uh, <clears throat> David, I'm so glad to uh, be here at this at part of the group. The, uh, I'm glad uh, everybody finished eating before I had to start talking. <laughs> uh, I was first in line. I didn't eat very much because uh, I just started recently a 30-day diet. <laughs> so far, I've lost 13 days. <laughs> I'm going to speak. By the way, uh, one thing I've learned, my brain cells come and go. The fat cells come and stay. <laughs> I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes, and then I'm going to... Uh, uh, open the floor for some softball questions. Uh, I'm going to ask my daughter Cindy to stand up when I've spoken for 20 minutes, and I'm going to ask Russell to stand up when he's ready, when he thinks that we've had all the questions we can stand. I'd like to start off by talking about my early days in real estate. I came to the University of Houston in 1946. It was right after World War II, and the, why I came to Houston was because of my father. My father felt like that Houston was going to be the center of the business world in time to come. There were about a half a million people in those days, Stuart, as I recall. Now in metropolitan Houston, six million people, four million in Harris County. So, because of my father, we decided to enroll at the University of Houston, which was only 18 years old, just like me. I was 18 years old. I had been drafted in World War II and was scheduled to report for active duty on September 17, 1945. I, had just, I was just finishing up at Brownsville Junior College. Brownsville Junior College. So, Harry Truman dropped two atom bombs on Japan in August of 1945. And the war ended a week later. Now it's true he killed 150,000 people and so forth with those bombs, but he saved millions of lives. I promise you, if we had invaded Japan, it would have been so costly on both sides. 
But that those bombs ended the war in uh, in seven days, and uh, they've been serving us well ever since, in my view. But anyway, my brother, my brother and I left Brownsville Junior College to enroll at the University of Houston. So he drove us up here, and I'll never forget, Glenn, what he said to us when he dropped us off. It was in front of trailer number 67, <laughs> an army surplus house trailer on the campus at the University of Houston. The bathroom was a block and a half away. So he said, all right, boys, I paid your first semester's tuition. I paid the first month's rent on this house trailer, 10 bucks. And he said, here is $50 each. And whenever you boys need anything, I want you to call me up on the telephone. That's the way we talked in those days. We call people up. <laughs> and he said, whatever you need, and whenever you need it, call me up on the phone, and I'll explain how to get by without it. <laughs> <laughs> and we've never heard from him financially again, but we got along just fine. In those days, you didn't expect them. I got a job running the uh, student newspaper. My brother and I had a comedy act that we performed in nightclubs, $10 a night. Uh, we did just fine. Houston was a different place in those times. Now, 66 years later, the University of Houston and I are still the same age. And although the University of Houston has never been more vigorous and youthful <coughs> and on the cutting edge, I, on the other hand, Jim, <laughs> I am moving more slowly. <laughs> David Thomas, if you hear me talking about happy hour, I'm talking about a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Russell, I never thought I'd say to myself, oh, to be 70 again. <laughs> What was Houston like? By the way, I'm glad to be here with Stuart Morris, the only man in the country older than I. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, um, I have some more to say about Stuart here in a minute. But what was Houston like in 1946? Well, there was a guy named Jesse Jones who was Mr. Everything. He had been Secretary of Commerce under Presidents Roosevelt and Truman. He had returned to Houston, uh, and he was the, without question, he was Mr. Houston. The most energetic, vigorous thing that ever happened in the city of Houston. And he set the tone that, in my view, exists today in Houston. We are a can-do city. There were seven hotels in no, there are eight hotels in downtown Houston. Jesse Jones owned seven of them. There were 12 office buildings in downtown Houston. Jesse Jones owned 10 of them. He owned the biggest bank. He owned the Houston Chronicle, the biggest of the three daily newspapers. He owned the biggest radio station. He was Mr. Houston. I knew him slightly. Uh, he was very tall, very dignified, wore a double-breasted suit, and I'll never forget one time I saw him in front of the Lamar Hotel where he lived, and he was catching, his chauffeur was picking him up <coughs> to take him down the block to McKinney on Main where he officed. And the chauffeur was driving a convertible. Why? Mr. Jones was so tall, he would bump his head getting in a limousine. <coughs> so literally, the uh, Captain of Houston uh, drove around in the back seat of a Ford convertible because of uh, his height. A very good time uh, for Houston and Texas and America. Uh, after World, <clears throat> World War II, I think we had some of the greatest years ever. Uh, but I'd like to speak about some other leaders uh, in Houston. Gus Worthen, for example. <clears throat> 
George Brown, uh, Jim Elkins, uh, the second largest law firm in town was named Fulbright, Crooker, Freeman, Bates, and Jaworski. <clears throat> and I knew all of, everybody, every one of them, except Fulbright who had died. And then Leon Jaworski was a, was a good friend. And if anybody wants to know how, when you're in your early 20s, you get to meet the dozen leading citizens of Houston and know them all well, ask me that during the question. I'll be happy to share that. <laughs> <laughs> but in those days, Houston worked together uh, in a way that, uh, that was unprecedented in America. Uh, I'll never forget when we segregated the lunch counters downtown. And uh, there were riots all over the country about, uh, about civil rights and so forth. There were sit-ins in the uh, Foley's downtown and Walgreens downtown where black kids would come and sit from TSU we didn't, in those days, it was the Texas State College for Negroes. Uh, and they would sit there and it wouldn't be served. And <clears throat> in Houston, I was Mayor Louis Q. Trera was mayor at this time. I was his buddy. And uh, so we called a meeting of all of the people downtown that served food. And <clears throat> Bob Dundas of Foley's, Stuart, you remember Bob? <clears throat> Uh, was the organizer of the effort, and he said, look, if we all desegregate at the same moment, we can get through this. <clears throat> so I was assigned the job of calling the Chronicle Post and the Houston Press and the uh, two, two television stations and talking them into downplaying it. <clears throat> and everybody cooperated. Imagine trying to do that today, trying to get the press to cooperate. <laughs> anyway, so the next Monday morning, uh, everything in Houston was desegregated in downtown, that is. Uh, and uh, without an incident, without a riot, without any problems at all. Houston has always had that ability to uh, do it. Ari Bob Smith was another leader. Stuart Morris was a leader in those days. Uh, still is a leader, for that matter. Let me tell you something about Stuart. When I first <coughs> started with real estate development. My first project was Jamaica Beach in Galveston. And I forget his name, but my closer was at the Stuart Title office in Galveston. And in those days, Stuart Title had two offices, one in Houston, one in Galveston, both of them kind of sleepy. And the, the chairman of the board was, a, uh, was Stuart's cousin. And suddenly the Morris brothers, Stuart and his brother Carlos, decided that that company had been sleepy long enough. So they literally came in and ousted the management, took over the company. And now, how many countries are you in now? Forty. Forty countries and all over America and, uh, and so forth. And it's all because of Stuart and Carlos Morris. No other reason. I was there. I saw it. I remember in the early days, it was like uh, they were like cheerleaders. They, uh, they all wore uh, blazers. The Stuart title executives wore blazers. What color were they? Blue, maybe? Royal Stuart. Red. <laughs> Royal Stuart. Carlos. Royal Stuart color. And <clears throat> the... Uh, but anyway, the, uh, because of Stuart and uh, Carlos and so forth, Stuart Title is a giant today. And I'm proud to do business with them. And we closed something last week with you, Stuart. So uh, uh, send me a note. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where was I? Ari Bob Smith. Ari Bob Smith was the largest landowner in Houston. And uh, the, he owns about 500 acres west of town, kind of close in, near Post Oak. It's now known as both sides of the West Loop. He owns 7,000 acres further out, Westheimer. 
now known as Best Both Sides of the West Belt. He was a uh, visionary. He didn't believe in real estate development. He kept telling me, welcome. If you try to take a piece of land and develop it, all you'll do is mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> he said, just buy it and hold it. Well, of course, my holding power was about 10 minutes. <laughs> so uh, I had to develop instead. <laughs> but, uh, but Bob Smith believed in real estate. I went, I went to work for him in the early 50s, and uh, I was going to go in the oil business. And he was going to send me to Snyder, Texas, where he had uh, just brought in a couple of wells. He went on to drill 90 wells in, in uh, Scurry County, Texas, without hitting a dry hole. 90 wells. It was a huge, huge find. And everybody asked, well, you, you're such a genius to know to lease up all this property, whatever. He says, I didn't want anything genius about it. It was just cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he made a statement towards the that I think is true. He said luck has a great deal to do with success in business. Luck, luck about the economy, luck about a variety of things. Uh, I know people in the Eagle Ford, Eagle, uh, Eagle Ford Shale area. Luck, they uh, you know, now they're paying some huge a thousand dollars an acre bonus money and such such as that. So luck has a lot to do with success of any kind, uh, I promise you that. But back to Bob Smith a minute. I'll never forget when he bought 500 acres of out in Westheimer. It was out by Stuart Marson's house, and I think about it. I ran cattle on Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, he paid $1,200 an acre. So he and I drove out there. I'd been to work, working for him for a short period of time. So we drove out there. And, and uh, stood around on the land, and I said, boss, uh, isn't it a shame? I said, all the good deals are gone. Here I am trying to get into the real estate business, and all of the good deals are gone. <laughs> and he said, you silly peckerwood. <laughs> if you want to know what peckerwood means, ask me in the uh, question section. <laughs> 